So welcome uh, to our <laughs> sunrise service after the sun has risen indoors. Uh, and yet, Christ is still risen, and that's why we are celebrating today, and we are able to come together and do that. And so we're looking forward to, um, to a time of celebrating. Uh, Enrique will be preaching, and then we will have a little bit of music, and then we'll take communion together, and then we will be able to anticipate the main service at 1030. For those of you who are joining us by streaming, uh, welcome. We weren't actually intending to stream this, but we decided to go ahead and do that since we were indoors anyway. And so we, uh, we're glad that you're able to join us by way of streaming. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Right after that, Enrique will come and he will bring us our, our morning message for this earlier service. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you and thank you for who you are. We praise you because you are a great God and we do serve a risen Savior. It's really every Sunday that we are to gather together and remember the resurrected Christ. It is in fact, the church and uh, your Christ said, I'll build my church and the gates of the grave will not prevail against it because of the resurrection. It is because of the physical, bodily, literal resurrection of Christ that we do not have an empty faith, but we have a faith that is real. And it is, an, it is incredibly important. And Father, as we come to you this morning, we praise you and thank you for that Christ is living. He is now seated on the right hand, on your right hand, and makes intercession for us all because we serve a risen Savior. And I pray today, both in this service and in the service to come at 1030, that you would be honored and you would be glorified in all that we say and do, that our worship would be sweet to you, and that um, we would really just be uplifted by the fact that Christ is risen indeed. And we pray for Enrique as he preaches, help our hearts and minds to be receptive and uh, help him to be able to communicate your truth from your word this morning. And we pray these things in Christ's name, amen. This morning we'll, uh, we'll start out in Mark chapter four, sorry, Mark chapter two. Mark chapter two is where we'll begin today. So as many of you know, I, uh, my full-time job is uh, working at an electrical distribution company. I am a sales representative uh, there, and um, one of the things that, that I get asked by my customers a lot is uh, that if, if I sell them a product, that it, he's asked, they ask if it will be UL listed. And what that means is that uh, if something is UL listed, it means that it's been tested. Uh, samples of the product have gone to them and they have uh, tested it to determine that it meets the, the safety requirements for that product. Uh, these requirements are often based on the UL's published and nationally recognized standards for safety. They want it to be certified, basically. They want it to be uh, 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 authorized to, to be used in whatever capacity they're being used. They don't want just the run-of-the-mill thing. Well, while on earth, Jesus did many miraculous things. And these works are not foreign to us, right? We, we're familiar with his miracles. We're familiar with him turning water to wine. We're familiar with him giving sight to the blind, healing the sick. But why, why did Christ do those things? Was it just to be kind? Uh, was it because he took such pity on those around him that he did it? Certainly he is a kind Savior, and certainly we do see him having compassion and taking pity on those around him. But I would contend that those aren't the only reasons that he did miracles. Before we get to the heart of today's message, I'd like to take us on a little bit of a journey this morning. We only have a limited amount of time. And so, many of you don't believe I can do a 15-minute message. <laughs> I don't think I can either, but we're going to try. <laughs> so, uh, I only have three and a half pages this morning. So, I, that, that's a good start, right? So, you're in Mark 2, and, and I'd like to start our little journey this morning by, by going to Mark 2, starting in verse 1. We're going to look at one of those miracles that Jesus did with a little closer detail. 
Verse 1, it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Have you ever been in a house so crowded that you really couldn't even move? I think that's the idea here. This, this place, however large the house was, it has reached its capacity and then some, just to hear Jesus. It is in this scenario that four friends bring a man with a serious need. In verse 3 it says, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when he had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now, we could really talk uh, at great lengths about what this meant for them to get, to open the roof and all that, and we won't take the time for that this morning. But the real point anyway here is that these folks showed the belief they had in Jesus they showed that they were going to do whatever it took to get to him. And that their faith, it, it was a faith that was in the right place. It was rightly placed in the person of Jesus. And it says exactly that in the next verse, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes who were sitting there reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, this is where the account gets interesting. The paralytic man never says anything in this passage, not once. Don't know his frame of mind, don't know exactly what he's thinking. Presumably, he wants to be there to be healed of his paral paralysis. However, Jesus tarks the guilt of his sin first and foremost, doesn't he? It is possible that the man, the paralytic, would have welcomed that since many of that time, and we've seen it in other portions of the New Testament, if someone has a disease or an ailment that's incurable, it's often associated with that person's sin, right? They, they think, well, it, it, judgment has come upon me because of sin in my life. It seems unlikely, it seems unlikely that the man would have come solely for the forgiveness of his sins given his physical state. It's possible, but it seems unlikely. Nevertheless, the point, once again, that this passage has is that the quality and object of his faith was right. And on this, on this basis, Jesus declares his sins forgiven. Well, when Jesus says this, the scribes, their ears perk up, right? They are aghast, and they rightly say, who in the world can forgive sins but God alone? Let's continue reading. Verse 8, but immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, so Jesus, they never really said this out loud for everyone to hear, but Jesus knows, right? He said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? What is Jesus asking here? Think about this question, which is easier? What's he saying? Well, by easier, what he really is saying in this case is he means, how can his authority be verified. So, look, it's actually very easy for me to go around, or anyone in this room, and look at someone else and say, your sins are forgiven. Oh, that's nice. But how is that verified? If someone's sins are forgiven, they don't walk around with some type of si sign saying, my sins are now forgiven, and it's verified. That's not how it works. No, it's very easy for someone to just declare, yes, your sins are forgiven, because it's not proven. It can't, it's not provable. But it is much harder to tell a lame man, a paralytic, to walk, 
Because if the person telling the person, the, the lame man to walk, doesn't have the authority to do so, he's not going to walk, is he? The results will make it obvious when he does or does not walk. Now look at what Jesus says next in verse 10. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And then he turns to the paralytic. He said to the paralytic, verse 11, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. What has Jesus just done here? He is stated so that you all know that he has the authority to forgive sins. He provides something for everyone to see that is much harder to do. In fact, it's impossible. It's much harder to do. It's impossible to do, but it is, is a lot easier to validate. He, he, he heals the paralytic. This is an incredible account of the power and the authority of Christ. But it is also a microcosm of the bigger picture that I want us to see today. In a similar way that, the, that Jesus healing the paralytic validates his authority to forgive sins, his resurrection validates his life and ministry as the Son of God. And for this, I'd like us now to turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Not unfamiliar words in this chapter. However, we might be able to see them in a fresh light today. You know, many, as you're turning there, many have claimed to be Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? There are people alive today that claim to be Jesus. There are people that are more, com more commonly known. I, I was reminded as I Googled some things, I was reminded of Charles Manson. I was reminded of David Koresh. These were individuals that claimed to be the Son of God. And do you know what happened to them? They died. Others who have who are claiming right now, I can guarantee you, they will not die and rise again from the grave. Those are dead and they are still dead. But Jesus died. Jesus, the very Son of God, died sacrificing himself. And out of all the signs and miracles that Jesus performed, the fact that he is dead no longer is the ultimate the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the ultimate miracle, the ultimate sign. Just like during his ministry, Jesus' miracles served a purpose, so does the resurrection. We saw in this passage in, in Mark chapter 2 that there was a point that Jesus was making. It was to authenticate his power and authority. Well, I would say this to us this morning. The resurrection authenticates his power, his authority, and actually a lot more. There are many results, there are many reasons for the resurrection that Scripture talks about. MacArthur, in his systematic theology, lists 20. And those are vitally important. Jesus predicted about himself that he would die and rise again. He prophesied that he would die and rise from the grave. And we see that in Matthew 17, 9, Luke 18, 31 through 33, John 2, 19 through 21. It's also vitally important because Jesus' resurrection confirms our future resurrection. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, specifically 12 through 19. But for our purposes today, I just like to look at Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now listen to this, verse 4. 
and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. What is this passage saying that Jesus, that the resurrection did? It is saying that the resurrection certified, authenticated that Jesus is the Son of God. This was the ultimate sign to the whole world. Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus is who others, his followers, said he was. He is exactly who he said he was. You know what this does? In a nutshell, it does three things. The resurrection validates everything Jesus did while on earth. Everything he did. The resurrection also, secondly, certifies everything he said while he was on earth. And this passage especially here says that the resurrection authenticates his very person as the Son of God. He is exactly who he claimed to be. The resurrection is the ultimate sign miracle for all of us to know that Jesus is, in fact, Lord and Savior. He is the only one worthy of that title, and it can never be stripped from him. So when we think of today, and when we think about the resurrection today, when we think about Jesus today, as we go through our morning together, we can know the Bible teaches us that, what we, that we can have 100% confidence in what Jesus taught, what He did, and who He is. That's the Savior that we get to worship today. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank You for the clarity of Your Word and the power of the resurrection, that resurrection that we get to share in. For just as He was buried and rose again, we practically are able to be buried in our sins and raised to newness of life. And we also have that hope in the future of our also when we are resurrected and we are given our new resurrection bodies. And Lord, we thank you that we can have such utter confidence in who Jesus is, what he did and what he said. I pray, Lord, that our view of Christ would be magnified and lifted up today that we would not have a small Savior, but He would be enlarged in our minds and hearts, that we would see Him in all His glory and majesty and would cause us to live for Him more faithfully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Baptist Church is a family made up of people from very different backgrounds and from every age group. But we all have one thing in common. We have found a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. When a person discovers how to have a genuine relationship with God, they are given a sense of purpose and meaning in life. When that same person belongs to a loving community where God's Word is taught, they will grow in their relationship with the Lord, and their life grows in purpose and meaning. Our focus is on making and building disciples for God's glory. We accomplish this through corporate worship on Sunday mornings, through adult Bible studies where we learn God's Word and how to effectively apply it to our lives, and through our discipleship home groups that meet in various locations throughout the region. Additionally, there are one-on-one -on -one and couple-to-couple -couple counseling and discipleship opportunities. We genuinely desire to help you grow spiritually any way we possibly can. Our children's ministries are extremely important to us. We have a lot of young families with children, and we believe in the importance of teaching truth to the next generation. Teachers and nursery workers will be available to introduce themselves and assist you in signing your children in and out of their classrooms. Bethel Baptist Church is a growing, loving family community. We hope that we've been able to show you a small glimpse of what Bethel is like. But we'd love to meet you personally Join us for a worship service, a small group, or Bible study. Let us be a blessing to you and your family.